Hi, everyone. Can you... Sounds okay, yeah? Okay, terrific. So <clears throat> I'm just going to give a very short talk today, summarizing some of the things, maybe adding a little more texture to what, uh, what John introduced um, very so eloquently. Uh, hopefully I'll be comparably eloquent, but um, we'll see how we go. Um, so so the, the genome. So I, I'm sure that all of you or some of you will have at least have heard of, of genomics and the genome at some point in your, in your lives or in the news and in the newspaper. We understand, I think, to some extent that genome is about DNA and it's about chromosomes. But what does that really mean? So every cell in our body actually has, contains our genome, every, every cell that is that contains a, a nucleus. So each of those cells has got the capacity and the capability to have all the information in it to provide the function for those cells or for that tissue. So whether it's cells in your eyes or in your heart or in your, uh, in your skin, these all behave differently, even though they have the same genome. So as John indicated, uh, we're all got almost identical genomes. In fact, our genomes vary by just a, um, less than 0.1% between us or the person sitting next to you. But remarkably, we all look quite different. All animals, all plants, all life on Earth has a genome. And that information is all contained in DNA, and that DNA is what defines what those organisms look like and how they, gr how they grow, how they develop, how they function, and also how they ultimately end up in disease. So I think that twin studies are always uh, looking at identical twins is a, is a wonderful way to just visually see just how accurately and how precisely the information in your genome is manifested through life. And with the, you know, at, at any point in life, you can see the remarkable similarities between identical twins, which is really just telling us that the information that's stored in there reproduces and there's a program that runs remarkably specifically. Now, for that same reason, it's also that mutations and when things affect that DNA and your genome, that we end up with disease. And virtually all diseases, in some way or other, are manifested ultimately through um, through the genome. So understanding, therefore, the genetic basis of disease, and just to put this in context, you know, where our genome is 3 billion characters long. I heard the analogy um, just yesterday that if one character of our genome was a centimeter wide, that that would stretch around the world, and we put our genome end to end, it would go around the world 44 times. I think this is a remarkable statistic, but it just gives an idea of just how much 3 billion really is. It's, these figures that, that, that uh, uh, are hard to conceive. But at the same time, just a single mutation in that, in that genome can, can cause uh, catastrophic and dramatic effects um, to affect health. So understanding this, of course, is completely critical. Genome sequencing is the first time that we've really been able to actually read that sequence and, 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 and identify the whole thing. So as John said, um, and there's a nice graph here which shows it, uh, that just 12 years ago to, to read that genome, to read that first complete human genome, uh, cost somewhere in the order of a billion dollars. Um, the second one cost about a hundred million dollars and it slowly just went down from there. And then we had a catastrophic and really quite an amazing inflection point in about July 2007, which was the development of the first massively parallel high throughput, high throughput sequences. So this was a new technology that made it possible to read this genome in a way that was, that was, um, that was inconceivable before. So we saw a, a steady and very, really quite a hyper-exponential drop in price over, uh, of cost of genome sequencing over the subsequent five or six years. And you'll see the point there in March 2014, which was uh, um, the date that our first sequences arrived here in, in the Garvin Institute. And we were one of the first two institutes in the world to get this technology, which brought the price down to this, the magical $1,000 figure, which was seen as the, as the figure where it became possible that perhaps we can really roll out genome sequencing in a way across um, at, at population level and where it could actually uh, really af affect healthcare and be used as a general diagnostic tool in the way that we today use an MRI or a CAT scan. So there are really, I think, uh, and this is what I'll talk through in this talk, are the, are the three main areas in which we see that genome sequencing is going to have a dramatic impact on healthcare. The first of these is in the diagnosis of inherited disease. So again, a rare inherited disease. We think about rare diseases, we think, well, 
Any one of these diseases, they've normally got long and unpronounceable names, yet at the same time, most of us will know somebody who has a rare disease. And I think that's the point of when you put all the rare diseases together, they're actually really quite common. Individually, exceptionally rare, but for that reason as well, we know extraordinarily little about most of those diseases, and there are no specific tests to even diagnose the majority of them. With genome sequencing, we've suddenly got a capacity to be able to diagnose any of these diseases um, in a way that was, that was inconceivable before. The second area is in, uh, is in cancer and the stratification of cancer, and that's something that, uh, that uh, I think both uh, Anne and David Thomas will talk about in a little bit more detail later. But very briefly, the concept that we're able to uh, genetically stratify cancer rather than just by looking at it through a microscope or identifying what tissue it came from in terms of informing how we might treat it is an enormous breakthrough and has tremendous potential. The third one is in the, uh, in the area of pharmacogenomics. We all know that we respond differently to different drugs. Um, uh, and it's a, a, you will have all seen the enormous list of contraindications that, um, that come on the, um, you know, the side effects for drugs that, that, that come with any prescription drug that you take. Why is it that you know, there's a possible side effects you know, which can be you know, a mile long affect some people and don't affect others. This is almost completely uh, encoded in your genome. So it's possible that by sequencing a genome before we prescribe a drug that we can anticipate whether or not that drug is right for that person or not. So just briefly, inherited disease and where I, why we see that this is really one of the key areas where we see genomics having a, a rapid and dramatic impact and we're seeing it already. So even before it was $1,000, even at $5,000 or $10,000, it was already dramatically affecting people's lives. Humans have somewhere in the order of about 21,000 um, uh, protein coding genes in their body, and at least 4,500 of these are known to cause disease. There are nowhere near 4,500 individual genetic tests out there to test for disease. And for those relatively small number of tests that there are, some of which exist just in a single laboratory in the world, those tests can cost thousands of dollars to do. So with genome sequencing, it's now feasible to replace all of those tests into one single test. So to think what that, what, what that really amounts to is that you don't no longer need to find that one specialist laboratory in, uh, in some exclusive part of Europe. It's now a test that we could, we could do here. We could do any test here. And it's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And this has the potential to spread around all across Australia and be something that's accessible to everybody. And it's accessible quickly. So one of the other main problems with the genetic disease, you, you would be doing one test at a time. So a geneticist would take a guess. He would think, okay, well, maybe it's this disease. We'll try and order this test. Three months later, six months later, they get it back. No, it was negative. Try the next one. Another three months, another six months, and so on. And it could take years, sometimes a decade, uh, to, and, and tens of thousands of dollars to just diagnose one disease. So I think that those days really are over. Um, and in fact, the, the rapidity is one of the other areas in which genomic testing really uh, has the potential to change things. So it's not just the breadth of the test, it's the fact that the test can actually be done in a few days. So now, on our instruments, for example, it takes just three days to sequence an entire human genome. Admittedly, there's a lot of time still involved in the interpretation of that data, but if we have a reasonable idea of what we're looking for, that interpretation can happen very quickly. This is a paper that showed um, in the case of, um, of neonatal intensive care, which is a, again seen as a really the low hanging fruit in terms of opportunity for genome sequencing, where it's feasible that when a child is born uh, who clearly has some sort of an abnormality or a genetic abnormality that's, that's manifesting itself, these, 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 these babies can cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a day, and it can be a, a, a desperate sort of a, a call for, um, for diagnosis. And, to think that there's now a, a, a test that could be um, you know, put in place reasonably quickly to provide certainty in what, what, the, what, what the issue is, is tremendously valuable. So cancer genomics, I'll just briefly touch on this. As John mentioned, um, there are two areas really in cancer genomics that, that make a lot of sense. The first is in the area of familial testing, that is the susceptibility or predisposition that you have for cancer. So, for example, you will have heard of uh, Angelina Jolie, I'm sure, and her, um, her genetic test. She had uh, both a, a mother and a grandmother who had died of breast cancer, or ovarian cancer, and, um, and had gone to get herself genetically tested for this gene called BRCA1. And she found that she carried this mutation, and as a result, went through and had a double mastectomy. 
um, as a preventative measure so that she wouldn't uh, hopefully succumb to breast cancer. So this is one area in which genomics is, is incredibly powerful. There are dozens and dozens of genes that cause predisposition to cancer and knowledge of those genes can, uh, can help you prevent cancer in your life. So that's one area. The second, which I'll talk about next, is, uh, is in the stratification of cancer. So every cancer is its own unique entity. It's something that went wrong. It's something that grew out of nowhere. Um, it, and as it stands, the best treatments are generally informed almost exclusively by, where, by what tissue they came from. So if you have breast cancer, you're treated in a particular way. If you have prostate cancer, you're treated in another. If you have melanoma, there are another suite of, uh, of treatments that are used in those cases. What we found now with genome sequencing is that we're able to define what the genetic basis of it is, what the biochemical basis of it is, what it is that's actually driving it. And remember, it's those things that the drugs are actually targeting. So by knowing what the biochemical basis is of, it, is of a disease, we can more intelligently choose what drug to use. So what this, this, this rainbow here is showing is um, are the diversity of different um, uh, biochemical problems that can occur with, a, with, a, with uh, different cancers. So you can see in GIST there, which is a gastrointestinal cancer, that is predominantly a single type of mutation that drives those cancers. But in the case of, say, ovarian cancer or melanoma, there's a huge swath of different biochemical bases. So what we can do is now turn this on its side and look not at where, which, which tissue a, a particular cancer uh, arise, arose from, but we, we're able, through genome sequencing, to work out what its biochemical basis is and use that to inform what drug to use or not to use on those cancers. In the future, we see a tremendous potential that... Um, and next generation sequencing and genome sequencing really feeds into this is the possibility to actually um, be able to detect cancer early by, being a, by doing a blood test. So the idea is, is that as a tumor metastasizes that you get circulating tumor cells that are actually in your blood. And then through a simple blood test and by sequencing the blood, we're able to detect whether some of these cells are actually there. And not only would we then be able to detect whether or not there is a cancer present, we may even be able to provide some diagnosis of it without requiring a further biopsy, or we might be able to know more precisely where to look for that cancer. So the last area that I want to mention is, is pharmacogenomics. This is a huge, huge potential future area. There is some, something in the order of 100,000 deaths a year in the U.S. From, uh, that, uh, of death through um, adverse drug reactions to prescription drugs. And in Europe, numbers are as high as 10% of hospital admissions as a consequence of adverse drug reaction. It's really a remarkable figure and, and something that we understand is it has a genetic basis, but we don't know uh, how, how, um, how that's completely borne out. There are also uh, many um, uh, treatments for things like cancer uh, that where you can react in an instantly toxic way where that treatment will actually kill you. So to have the prior knowledge of this through uh, having that genetic information, again, is very, very powerful. So there are potentially hundreds of these interactions known, and there's a, there's a huge potential here to, to be able to predict um, drug testing. I'll just really briefly touch on this, because I've only got a couple of minutes left, um, is the idea of wellness genomics and the idea of actually sequencing a well person's genome to see what you can find out about yourself that might be useful for... Um, your life. So there's a few things there, like for example, screening for recessive diseases, uh, uh, looking for your cancer susceptibility, as I mentioned, drug interactions, and so on. There are lots of other cool things you can do too. Um, so uh, these are these are different types of these are sort of some of the direct to consumer tests that are out there, where you can tell other things about yourself as well. So for example, you can tell your ancestry from your genome. You can find out what proportion you uh, uh, your genes come from different parts of the world. So for in this case. You know, for myself, I can find that, I'm, that I'm, I have a proportion of uh, <laughs> East Asian, Northern European, French and German backgrounds. So that maybe explains my name. Um, and I can also see what proportion I'm, I am related to even Neanderthals. So all this information <laughs> is actually out there uh, in, in your genome. So that's kind of a, a fun thing. But on a more serious note, whole genome sequencing can also reveal other things about yourself. So in the case of myself, I did sequence my, uh, had my whole genome sequenced last year and found out that I had a disease known as malignant hypothermia susceptibility, which is a, uh, uh, when I first read this report, I was like, hypothermia? I don't have hypothermia, let alone malignant type, but apparently what that actually means, and if the, 
uh, speak to any doctor and they realize very quickly what that is, is that it's a sensitivity to general anesthetic. So potentially if I was to, uh, well, I've never had general anesthetic, but if I was, that I could actually have a very severe adverse reaction to that. So that's kind of a cool thing that I was able to learn from my own genome sequence. And the genome sequence report tells you all about that and the mutation, and you can go then forth and verify this information. So that's kind of neat. I'll just finish here with Johnny Depp. Um, individualized uh, genomes, we think, are the future of, uh, of, of individualized care. Populations of genomes, we think, are the futures of medical research. And I think this is a really exciting bit. And when we start bringing all this information together, we can understand so much more about how our genomes are and how they work. And what we're trying to do here now at the Garvin is to try and sequence vast numbers of people. We've got the potential now to sequence 15,000 genomes a year. When we bring this information together, the amount that we'll understand about correlating different characteristics, such as these drug responses, to our, our genes and our genotypes, that we're then able to uh, in, inform this so much better than was ever possible before. And I think that this will really in, reinvent our traditional models of research, where we uh, once you know, developed a genetic test in a, uh, in a research environment, and then these tests were then rolled out in pathology clinics. What we see happening in the future is perhaps a much more bilateral opportunity for translational research, where in fact every patient becomes an opportunity for research, which is a, a, a remarkable uh, position to be in, where we can use that genome sequence not only to diagnose everything we understand, we can return that information to the clinician, and then all that information that we don't understand, we can use to inform research and to learn more about us, and hopefully learn more about, um, about what we can do. Uh, with genetic information and keep improving this information through a, a, a cycle. So there's an anticipation, I think, that in a decade or two, everyone's genome will be sequenced um, if they should choose to do so, and perhaps even at birth, and that these databases will, will kind of start to shift um, uh, this, this idea of moving to optimizing health rather than just crisis management, and that hospitals and physicians will really need to change their practices quite dramatically in order to... Um, in order to be able to take this all on. So there's a huge challenge, an educational challenge as well, that'll go into the future. And with that, I think I'll stop talking, and I hope that you'll uh, join me in embracing genomic medicine into the future. Thank you.